yo, 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 and welcome back to Creeps and Crimes Podcast. I'm Taylor. And I'm Morgan. And this is episode 84. Yeah. Can you even believe it? Valerie, can you even believe it? Can you believe it? We go. Got a lot going on right now. I just got back last night around one in the morning from Sorry Marley's bachelorette party. First things first, yes. you guys are rock stars with the whole Venmo the bride of drink. Oh my god, y'all blew her shit up. You guys are so funny. It's like, pour that shit up. Hashtag creeps and crimes. Like love sorry I, Marley. I love that. And she did too. That was that was that awesome. was so dope of y'all. Thank you so much for um, doing that for the her. The party was really good. Okay, good. We had a lot of fun. We had a lot of I had a lot of drinks. Yeah. And <laughs> I felt it this morning going to work at <laughs> six in the morning. You're in a detox session now. I was like, I walked in. I, what was crazy, though, was that last night was the littlest sleep that I've gotten in probably weeks. Mm-hmm. And I get to work and I'm like, all right, let's go. Let's go. How's it. everyone doing today? I'm like, I woke up fine. I was like, maybe I should be getting three hours of sleep every night. But now I'm like, oh, shit, the wave's over. No, yeah. Actually, right around lunchtime, I was like, the wave is over. It's done. It's crashed. It is <laughs> but I was on the like, beach. like crackhead energy this morning walking yeah. in, and I was like, just like, why? I'm ready. I'm at golden retriever. I was like, today, wait, bitch. am I drunk? <laughs> I wasn't. I hadn't drank like, in like 24 hours. But. You literally, technically, probably might have been still had alcohol in me yeah. from <laughs> yeah. Monday morning. Hey, if you're listening to this from the lab, we're fucking around. She did <laughs> yeah, not. no, I wasn't. But she was not. I felt it. I was just like like super fucking wired but yeah. um the best we had so much fun we did a tiki boat tour it oh, was so that sounds so that fun. was so fun we had the best captain ever his name was captain dave oh captain and dave. he was just like so dope and like so chill and like it, it did suck i get a call I'm, we're on our way there and i get a call and she's like hi this is so and so from tiki boat tours i just want to let you know that it's really windy out today we're not going to be able to get out of the marina but no. we're still going to give you guys your ride okay thank god and so excuse me we were like okay that's fine like we're still on right yeah whatever so we get there and they weren't kidding like we sir <laughs> we circled the marina probably 15 times but honestly after <laughs> after the fact i was like wait i wouldn't have even noticed a difference because i wasn't paying attention to where we were and actually being out in sea i probably would have gotten a little sick i think oh 100 and um it was choppy like we went up to like right where like the rocks are where it opens yeah where it like opens up and it was like ugh, the water was coming in on the boat i, I was can't. like let's get out of here yeah. but like we Take circled us back to the marina we circled so many times so we were so like paying attention to what was on the boat it didn't matter it was yeah. a lot of fun i definitely recommend it if anyone's in the st Pete area it's called totally tiki tours it's oh fun oh my god that's so dope yeah that sounds like so much fun yeah so the rest was really great um but taylor where are you gonna be at when this episode drops guys when this episode drops i'm gonna be uh in la nice i have just left san diego and i well i left san diego and then i went to disneyland and then now i'm in la oh my gosh i'm so jealous you guys are going to disneyland i'm i'm this is my first time ever going to california i've I've never been to the disneyland there i've only been to california once and it was like a layover and like me and my friend kimber jumped out and went to like venice beach or something so dope yeah but it was like it wasn't like i love those moments like when you're traveling those are my favorites yeah oh no i'm really excited this is my first time ever going to california this is my first time ever going past oklahoma i've never been anywhere wet well i've well i've skipped it all to go to hawaii arizona oh i went to arizona yeah that was my first that's what it was that was my first time going over there i went to arizona and nevada and where else did i go Someone somewhere else Maybe like New Mexico is right there no. or Utah or something. Maybe. Who cares? It doesn't matter. Anyways, Logan's this is my so first excited time. for the Marvel thing, though, at oh, Disneyland. Yes. With the Spider-Man, the animatronic. No, I'm not even excited for that. And Oh, wait. That's not at Disney. No, that's at Universal. Oh, you guys aren't going there. Wait. wait is, is it at Disney? Because technically Disney does own Marvel. It is at Disney. But when I was in Universal Orlando, all of the Marvel stuff was at Universal. Right. Yeah. I think that's a touchy subject between Marvel and Disney. (laughs) Sorry, guys. Don't mean to get into that. Like, I think like they were like contracted in for me like 20 years. I forget. Someone told me at work and they like told me all about it. (sighs) And I was like, that's pretty fucked up. That is pretty fucked up. But yeah. But when what I'm most excited about with Disneyland is, yeah, I'm excited to go to Disneyland. And hey, if you have listened. Oh, yeah. The Patreon's already dropped by now. Yeah. So you've gotten all the Disney things. Yeah. Is that what's next? 
Yeah. Yeah, it is. You guys have gotten all the Disney things. So maybe I'll learn more while we're there. Yeah. Um, but maybe you'll check out the Haunted Mansion. Oh my God. I'm so excited. I'm going to be looking for Or the for space. You have to do the Space Mountain. Try to find the one way man. Oh. Mr. One Way. Oh my God. I'm going to be like, just sitting there waiting on him actually <laughs> i'm gonna actually be doing a they're like ma'am can you please leave the ride and i'm gonna be doing a loop i'm just waiting for mr one way i'm like actually i'm a reporter so <laughs> they're like no you're not but i'm most okay sorry i keep saying this over and over again but what i am most excited for for the entire like california ordeal as a whole i am most excited about trying korean corn dogs oh that is all i've wanted since 2020 in the pandemic yes i'm I'm so excited about the food i've got this sushi place that i'm going to this brunch place that i'm going to um actually technically three sushi places i'm going to this burrito place that's like in a gas station that's like the best burrito in uh, san diego or something like that you know who you should meet up with who camden you know who i should meet up with is camden and lexi and Lexi, I told I literally didn't remember until today that oh, everybody I know lives there. But we're meeting with our friend Chris. Remember Logan's friend from college, yeah. and then Parker's coming with us. We're all going to go to Disneyland together. That'll be so much fun. Yeah, so I'm really excited. You're going to die when you see my Airbnb, guys. Be watching if you haven't already. Be on my Instagram because <laughs> I'm about to blow maybe it up. become an influencer. Who knows? She's going to blow it up. I'm going to be blowing up, and I need you guys to share me. Okay. Like me, hang me up, engage with me. (laughs) Like my shit. Um, But anyways, what are you going to be doing next week? Being Uh, very happy. You're going to be on vacation from me. Look at that. It's going to be the best week ever. (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. I'm going to be working. Yeah. But I will have a lot of dog park days, I bet. You will. In my near future. And I won't be bothering you. Other than to be like, can you go feed the cats? (laughs) Also, can you feed the cats? Let's add a third Actually, it's not even the (laughs) fish. It's not even the cat. It's a fucking fish now. No. I'm like, Logan, Autom- he better go to the freaking pet supermarket and get an automatic feeder. That's what I said. Let's go get an automatic feeder. But these fish are dumb, y'all. They're so dumb. Did I can't you get a get third yet. It. I didn't even look. What? Did you get Gacy yet? No, but they they just keep dying. They literally, when I say like keep dying, like they'll be floating. Oh, belly up. And, and then, then they're alive. I'd come back five minutes later and they're alive again. I'm like, they, I mean, their their eyes weren't moving. Their fins weren't moving. And I come back in. And Not then John they- Wayne. Oh, I'm literally like, uh, you know what? These have the name have been has been removed. I knew that's what I get for glorifying some fucking serial killer somewhere. You're right. But like, I was like, I can't. I literally don't. I, I hate the fish. I hate the fish. I hate the fish more than any other animal. I, I'm literally like, I'd rather have a dog than a fish. Yeah, that's where I'm at. You you know what I want to talk about right now? What is everyone's answers to get into the Facebook group? <laughs> Guys, they are so fucking funny. Y'all don't fucking Literally, listen. somebody put, whoever you are, you made our day. It said, what are Taylor and Morgan's pets' names? And somebody put Lola. <laughs> that is Taylor's sister. That's it was so funny. I screenshot. I said, there's no way. No, someone said the other day, it was, cr- I sent it to you. It was cracking me up. It said, you know, what is your favorite drink? What is our favorite drink? Yeah. And it was like Taylor red wine. And Morgan, whatever concoction Taylor comes up with before she gets over to her house. I was dying. Yeah. Concoctions. Ah, Guys, maybe after this crazy summer, we can go back in, which fall is normally when I'm in my wine phase. Yeah. That I'll be ready. We'll be in our wine moods again. Yeah, for sure. Summer, we do a lot of tequila. Tequila. Vodka. And then it kind of stretches. And then, you know, holiday season, everybody has to drink a little extra because it's mm-hmm. holidays. Right. Um, but anyways, uh, this summer, we're kind of super busy, which is something we have to talk to you about. So and then we're going to move on to the episode and let's shut the F serious. up. So let's get really serious. By the way, I hope you really enjoyed having Arletta on with us last week. Oh, we, we loved it. Loved we loved it. it. OK. It was like so fun for us. We haven't had a like a, a podcasting guest since her, really. Yeah. Like one that's actually comfortable on mic, you know. Mm-hmm. So that was really interesting. Um, we had a great time. Yeah, a- no, we had amazing a, time. It was it was good to see her and catch up and like we well, just all vibe with the same thing. So mm-hmm. it's like so easy to just throw her on here and like thank and, you, Arletta, for coming on. That yeah, was- thank you so much for coming on again. And like also seeing like where we are in life mm-hmm. now versus the last time we were Recorded, on. I love yeah. having that little piece of us like recorded. All together, yeah, yeah, just, just all like together. forever. It's just so crazy. It's gonna be. I'm Literally, my kids are going to have an iPhone one day and be like, Google Mom. search. They're going to find out my maiden name and they're going to be like, Morgan Mounts. And then, bup, 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 Crimson Crown is going to pop up. I'm no, gonna they're like, going to be oh, like, shit. Mom, why did you do this? This is so embarrassing. Yep. They will do. I, I'm like, y'all are assholes. 
Yeah. Y'all are assholes. Like, we had so much fun. Um, but no, let's get serious oh, yeah. real quick. Let's get serious. We have, I know we've talked about it before, and like you guys can obviously tell because for the last three episodes now, we've been talking about, oh, sorry, Marley's bachelor party is coming up this week. <laughs> Whenever you guys are like, that was three weeks ago, you said that. Like, you saw we've it. been, we've been having to pre record everything. I'm gone one weekend. Taylor's gone the next. Everyone mm-hmm. in our lives is getting married right now. Everyone's having children children everyone's got showers everyone's got lunches bachelorette parties lunch <laughs> birthdays like it, it's just like really really intense right now so um we're, we're just gonna be doing our best for you we're doing our best we are have are, have been working very hard to plan out this content and meanwhile we're working to expand what creeps and crimes is to make it better quality for you guys on all platforms so that we're and not so stressed and i can quit every job that i have yes literally every single job gone <laughs> gone so. um we're working a lot more on the business side of creeps and crimes too trying to you know get things that you guys would be comfortable with trying not to overrun you with ads even though that's a really big deal for us um right. and they mean a lot for us when you engage with them um and it helps us to grow even more but you know there's a lot of things that are going on behind the scenes that we don't want to bore you with and in the end we just need you to know like if there is ever an issue or if you don't like you know you think something's going downhill don't leave us just just text us just dm us we respond all the time and if we don't then you're in our request and you look like a hacker and it says hidden message for yeah. sensitive activity and we check them like once every two weeks literally like i and, and don't worry like we we will respond to you we'll try to fix whatever we can like we really do want you guys to enjoy this because in the end this is for you right um and we just love you guys to pieces so when we say like literally throw that shit on cruise control there might be a fucking episode where we are in the car recording with that shit on cruise control yeah. like that is where we are at making ends meet in the in the mess that this is uh this summer so with all of that being said we love you guys bear with us for the next bit keep downloading keep we'll telling get it your friends out there. yeah we'll get the content there we're, we're we're getting it out for you it's got great research we might not be like as bubbly and funny and drunk as normal but i promise the content's there and uh we're gonna do everything that we can and by the way by the way who the the friend that i met in the post i mean not the post office the passport office um hi 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 i got recognized (laughs) i got recognized are you kidding and by the way guys we see all of your reviews and more the 83 83 came out and literally the day after we recorded 83 i wake up our reviews shot i i'm drunk as fuck i get a text you have single-handedly destroyed the reviews i'm like oh shit you guys do like it everybody's like i'm team crime i'm team crime i'm team crime morgan i love you i'm team crime i'm like dude they, if someone comes you know and looks at this people gonna, are like oh i feel so bad bro. let me just type this out real quick you know what i'm thinking about like if someone were to come and like get a glance at the reviews before listening to that they're gonna be like damn that true crime girl must fucking suck they're gonna they're gonna actually hop on Podbean. never mind <laughs> no, <laughs> we'll go don't we'll, go there patreon knows he's gonna come after us <laughs> all right guys uh i guess we'll get into the content for you guys now so morgan hit them with it if you're driving throw that shit on cruise control if you got a glass pour that shit up and let's get creepy <laughs> Okay, Morgan, what do you have for us today? Okay, on that note, um, this is one of those weeks for me. So I got a short and sweet case for you guys, <laughs> but it is a good case. It's actually crazy and it's really disturbing. Okay, yay. Um, so this is the case of Michael Taylor. Ooh. Michael Taylor was born on September 21st, 1944 in West Yorkshire, England. Michael grew to marry a woman named Christine, who then gave birth to five children, all boys. Oh, God. Big, big, big family. Big boys. Um, Working as a butcher with five hungry boys, the Taylors were not excessively wealthy, but they had enough money that they could feed their kids and pay for a roof over their heads. Most accounts would argue that the Taylors were comfortably middle class until about 1974. Um, the Taylors were pretty well known around the town and would eventually become one of the most popular families in the town's history for the wrong reasons. 1974 in England was the middle of a hard time economically. It was a recession. And to make matters more difficult for the already making ends meet Taylor family, their provider, Michael, the father, 
injured his back and began to suffer from constant back problems that left him struggling to keep his job. Oh, no. As a result, between the back issues and the economy of the country suffering, financial difficulties began to suffocate the family. This is believed to be the starting point before the father of five began to spiral down into a deep and dark depression. And the family was suffering from it. A family friend had suggested that maybe they start to attend church, suggesting that Michael or suggesting to Michael that the depression was actually caused by spiritual forces. So attending church would help cure his depression. Okay. The Taylors, though, they weren't really a religious family. And in a town where there was five churches within a couple mile radius of their house, they still managed to skip out on Sunday gatherings. Like they just weren't <laughs> into it. Yeah. But they thought that this might be the saving and hope that they needed. Therefore, they agreed. They began attending a weekly prayer group. And this group was run by a Miss Marie Robinson. And she was very, very appealing to Michael. Mm. She was soft spoken, sweet, and she was very helpful in aiding Michael's mental health. Over the next few weeks, Michael became an enthusiastic member of the church. I'm talking attending everything, volunteering their own family home for group meetings, and spending an awful lot of time with Miss Marie. He <laughs> was obsessed with Marie's teachings attending every single one of her hosted groups at their house where members would be exercised and demons would be cast out with the power of God. What? So Marie, that's like, it was a prayer group, but like what kind they, of, they, you know, those videos on TikTok were like, uh huh. Churches will exercise. And like, I think this is what the, that vibe was. And they're like, they touch them and they fall down on the ground. Like, yep. Oh my God, my grandma's shirts. That's what that one's like. Yeah. Um, and then Marie began to offer um, a type of like private meetings to Michael, like private sessions. She really wanted to help him mm -hmm. at his own home. Mm -hmm. Michael told Marie that he was afraid of the moon. So therefore, during their meetings, Michael and Marie would sit across from each other and just make the sign like a, the si cross sign. What is it? Father, son, yeah. Holy Spirit the over and over trilogy. and over again. Almost in like this trance-like state Trinity. for sometimes up to eight hours. What? Marie was staying up with Michael all hours of the night in his home doing this. The two believed that doing this repetition like action would nullify the moon of all evil power that it had over Michael. So this woman. They were trying to exercise the moon. They were trying to exercise the moon, but this woman was coming to his house every single night. They were staying up all night and... They were speaking in tongue. So his wife didn't even know what they were saying. So. I would not be okay um, with that. <laughs> like they, yeah, they were spending all of their time together. And it wasn't long before their relationship became a little less friendly and a little more romantic. Yeah. And his wife, Christine, was not about it as she should. Yeah. Right. Um, she began to notice that anytime her husband wasn't around Marie, he would fall back into this like depressive state this like like well. slumber and like he would just like start lash he was very angry and aggressive and he started lashing out at her and the kids he was Anytime. like addicted to her yeah it's he like loved marie yeah um and christine knew she had suspicion that something was going on between her husband and the group leader marie therefore at the very next meeting christine openly confronted michael Ooh. about marie Ooh. demand in front of the entire prayer group demanding to know if they were having an affair, which they both denied. And Christine knew they were lying, so she then suggested that the two leave the room together to talk things out, as in Michael and Marie. Oh. Which I would be like, yeah, you guys go leave the room and talk things out, and um, I'll also be right there with you. Yeah, I'll be recording I'll be hearing things. the <clears throat> entire conversation about whatever you guys Make are sure talking about. Make sure you stand about. next to the door, babe. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, so the two left until moments later when Michael called everybody from the prayer group into the room that him and Marie were conversing in, announcing that we have won a great victory for the Lord. A miracle had happened. We have both overcome our passions. So everyone come in here. He's like, you know, the praising this, praising that. Like we did it like da 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 da. Like they were like maybe attracted. Like No one really knows what they said because they spoke to tongue. They spoke in tongue the entire time. So maybe what I would interpret this as is like, yes, they were into each other. Their wife called them out. They went in the room. They talked and they overcame their passion. Like the good, like, thank the, you, the Lord. The Lord took that lust away from them. Yeah. That's like how I'm kind of interpreting Yeah, that's what it. I was interpreting But too. then within seconds, Michael, well, Mar 
Christine's standing there like, what the fuck what are you even talking are about? You doing? And Michael flips like a light switch, showing a side that nobody, not even his wife Christine, had seen before. Something just triggered him. After this announcement, Michael stood up. And instead of addressing Christine, he began to attack Marie in front of the entire group. Oh my God. Like they were just in this like, oh, da, da, we've overcome our passions. He begins to start attacking Marie. Everybody's and I'm, in like there. lunges at her. He's physically assaulting her. He's verbally assaulting her. And they were screaming at each other in tongue. Oh. So the prayer group is like trying to restrain Michael. And right. it took a good bit of men to restrain Michael back. Yeah. And later, Marie would describe this moment as, quote, this is a quote from Marie Robinson. I suddenly glanced at Mike. First off, she calls him Mike. I suddenly glanced at Mike and his whole features changed. He looked almost bestial. Bestial? bestial? It's spelled like bestiality, but no ality. Bestial? Bestial? Bestial. Bestial. He kept looking at me and there was a really wild look in his eyes. I started screaming at him out of fear. I started speaking in tongues. Mike also screamed at me in tongues. I was on the verge of death and I seemed to come to my senses. I knew that only the name of Jesus would save me. And I just started saying over and over again, Jesus, Jesus. When Christine heard me calling on the name of Jesus, she started saying it too. And I believe firmly that I was only, that it was only by calling on his name that I was not killed that night. So I think what they're saying is that this man had like, Michael had three personalities come that night. Like he you know, first he's in the prayer group and yeah. he's obsessed with Marie. So he's enjoying his time. Then his wife comes out and she calls him out and she's like, they're like, no, 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 no. Sends him to another room. They talk probably in tongue. And then they come back out and they're like, oh, praise be. Da, 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 da. And then he attacks her. Not even right. his wife. He attacks Marie. In like a few seconds. Like, like it, it was very like something was going on. Like split. Something. Yeah. Very split. That's a that's a good way to play it play it say it um after the incident michael claimed that he had no memory of it whatsoever Mm. and better yet you're gonna love this marie went to the house the next day and forgave him giving him full absolution of all of his actions that night before but the group and michael's wife wouldn't let his outburst go unnoticed thank god it actually became the talk of the town which eventually reached the ears of a local Viker and his wife, Father Peter Vincent and Sally Vincent. Father Vincent was a 52-year-old Anglican priest at St. Thomas Church. He invited, once he heard about the whole debacle, the outburst, <laughs> the he drama. invited Michael and Christine over to the house for like an assessment over dinner mm. that would later declare Michael as suffering from a demonic possession. Mm. The dinner was chaotic. Tableware was broken and thrown and Michael showed the side that attacked Marie just a couple nights prior. Some accounts even report that Michael actually tossed Father Vincent's cat out the window. I'm going to toss my cat out the window. <laughs> she, Can she y'all knows. hear she's, her? She knows, she knows what we're doing. She knows we're talking about her. Yeah, she's pissed. Maybe that was her in a past life. Did you get thrown out the window, Nona? Um, after the dinner or assessment whatever you want to call it father vincent reached the conclusion that michael was possessed and desperately needed an exorcism claiming that he was filled with multiple different evil spirits who were out to destroy his life and those in it after the dinner the children were sent to stay with the grandparents fortunately so to avoid the tragic that would unfold over the next two days oh god on October 5th, 1974, Father Vincent, along with Reverend Raymond Smith, met Michael at St. Thomas Church. In attendance was a group of ministers and the prayer group. Here, they performed an eight-hour-long exorcism on Michael Taylor. No. Why is a prayer group there? Why? why? Like, this is so culty to me. Yeah, why do we have, the, why did they have to come? Yeah, I don't get That's it. That's like when we do sorority show, like when we have to do a sorority show, we're like, why the fuck are we all here? This <laughs> like, why do we sense. all need to be here? <laughs> Um, During this exorcism, Michael reportedly was thrashing and convulsing, spitting, swearing, and eventually had to be tied down to the floor of the church because he was attacking everybody. Dude. Um, They jammed. So at the end of this, a lot of people that were there reported that Michael was physically and verbally assaulted um, by the people surrounding, like in the room with the exorcism. Um. But this is true that they jammed a crucifix into his mouth and they were like soaking him in holy water, like almost to the point of like waterboarding. Oh, oh my I almost God. Dropped my phone. 
um, and doing so, casting out any and all demons that had taken over Michael Taylor. Did they not fucking maybe just like think that maybe it's not a demon? Maybe he just needs like a doctor, right? Or psychiatrist, right? Oh I don't my think god. So. Um, he was growling at anyone who came close to him and he was forced to confess sins that people would later say that he never even committed. Like they were making him to be like, Con- like confess this, confess that. He's like, I don't do that. Like, I'm not like this. I'm not that. Like what? Like, yeah. Like it was very like a, a kind of a very messed up exorcism. Yeah. Um, at around 8 a.m. on October 6th, the priest could no longer continue. They were exhausted. Yeah, they beat the shit out of this dude. Therefore, they ended the exorcism and told Michael that they would have to finish it the following day. According to their admission, Father Vincent said that he had casted out more than 40 demons from Michael, including demons that represented blasphemy, incest, bestiality, and hearsay. He also, but he told, he's like, we have to do this later, but also, Michael, don't worry. Like, we're not done. You have three <laughs> demons left in you, but like, we'll get to, we, we, got, we got 40. We got 40 out. We got 40 out. It took me eight hours. It but you have, hours. yeah, but you have three left. So like, but we can't do the three. So like, just go home, take a nap and come back later. And we'll get the three. The three that are left in you represent, where am I? They represent murder, madness, and violence. But don't you worry, we got out hearsay. Dude, get those fucking ones out first. <laughs> what, can what we you, pick and choose during exorcism? Leave gluttony. Leave, <laughs> leave gluttony. Leave, leave hearsay. hearsay. I mean, this sounds like the seven dwarfs. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Leave dopey. Go ahead and take all these psychos out of leave, here. Yeah. yeah. What? How do you even tell that? Right. Yeah. So they said that they, that they like reassured him. Like he's like, I don't know, guys. Like I just got really fucked up real quick. Like you just got 40 out. Like am I really good? You They're like, the you'll be fine. You only have three left and they represent murder, <laughs> madness and violence. This is ridiculous. This is a fever dream. Yeah. A member of the prayer group was when they said that they were ending the exorcism when, while they were wrapping up. Um, it was a woman. And she said that she was basically pleading for them not to stop, saying that she just had this feeling that he was going to kill his wife, Christine. Oh, no. And a lot of people actually, like, will verify that she did say that, which is very crazy when yeah. we get to the next part, which I'm guessing you can conclude from what I just I, said. I got it. Um, so Michael and Christine were sent home and told to prepare for part two of the exorcisms. Prepare for murder, madness, and violence. This really isn't funny, but it's just... This just it's is just like really fucked to up. me. It's um, it's not funny, but it, it just makes no sense. Yeah. An hour and 45 minutes later, after the exorcism, around 945 in the morning, police patrolling the area discovered a gruesome scene outside the Taylor home. It was it, They saw a man stumbling through the streets, naked and covered in blood. And of course, it was none other than 32-year-old Michael Taylor, who reportedly told the police that this is the blood of Satan. The officer immediately, who recognized him, because it was the talk of the town. Yeah. Um, the officer immediately rushed to the Taylor house where he was met by officers that were already on the scene. Oh, God. Um, because neighbors had called it in. They could hear things. And this is a huge trigger warning. This is very gruesome. Um, upon entering the house, officers were met with one of the most gruesome crime scenes in England history. Um, Christine, or sorry, Michael had brutally attacked, mutilated, and murdered his wife, Christine removing her eyes and tongue before ripping her face off of her skull. Her skin and blood were splattered across the walls, the floor, and the furniture. There was a trail of blood that led from the back door to the living room where Christine's body laid, which is gruesome enough, um, but on top of that, the family poodle wasn't even spared. The dog was found dead, strangled to death with its limbs pulled from its bodies and thrown across the room. And its hair, its teeth, and its eyes were removed from its skull. Why the fuck did they send her home with him? Right. Leave him tied up on the basement floor. I'm like, I don't, I, you know, obviously, like, we don't know much about the situation. We, yeah, we, you know, um, it's very rare. Like, this this kind of thing is very rare. rare but I, actually, I don't even want to say that. But um, I guess what I'm saying is like in, in movies, which isn't a good example, but like you see how like people that are possessed are normal. Mm-hmm. And then it's just like usually at nighttime or like a flip of a switch and like, I don't know, maybe or it's that's like a, a trigger or like a, a, like you said, like 3 a.m. Like those right. things. It's like always something that triggers them. Mm-hmm. So <sighs> dude, that, it was very, yeah, that is nasty. I, I, you might get to this. I get some bad vibes about Mary. Oh, yeah. 
Is that you're coming to that? Uh, I, I don't cover it, but we can talk about okay, it. Okay, we'll talk about it later. Um, yeah, that's definitely some theories that yeah. we could throw out there. Um, da, 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 sorry. Um, officers on scene were like doubling over vomiting at the site inside of the Taylor's house, and they searched the home for any weapon, but they found nothing. There was just no way. They, they, they couldn't believe that this was done by Michael Taylor's bare hands, so therefore they kept searching until the medical examiner revealed that there was no weapon to be found. There were no knife marks or any evidence that showed a weapon was involved. He did this bare handed. Now, how can a five foot eight guy like do something like that? I mean, I would have to have my acrylic nails on to do that shit. Yeah. Uh, Michael Taylor was arrested for the murder of his wife, Christine, where he would never provide motive for killing her. In fact, when interviewed um, or interrogated, he said that this is what he said, quote, released. I am released. It is done. The evil in her had been destroyed. Um, during his trial the following March, Michael Taylor was acquitted from all charges on the grounds of insanity. He was sent to Broadmoor Hospital for two years, then spent another two years in a secure ward before being released back into the public. I'm speechless. I'm speechless. Four years. He mutilated his okay, wife. Okay, you can, you can plead insanity to get your trial fucking pushed until you're okay enough to stand trial. Right. You don't you don't rip someone's fucking face off with your bare hands and walk t to see another day. Right. He's still alive. His final diagnosis <laughs> during his time at the ward were not publicized. So we're not sure what exactly they concluded. Um, but Michael Taylor, um, during this time that he was released over these 30 years, attempted suicide four times, each effort failing. Oh, no. However, one leaving him with a severely injured back leg back severely injured back and legs after he attempted or he did throw himself off of a bridge um for 30 years after the trial michael taylor kept a relatively low profile until 2005 when he was arrested and charged for indecent conduct with a minor after inappropriately touching a teenage girl um from this charge yeah he's i don't sick. feel bad about anything anymore from this charge he spent one week in police custody where he began to exhibit his symptoms of possession the same ones from 30 years prior you're not fucking possessed he was released on bail and vanished until trial where he pleaded guilty to two accounts of sexual assault and was sentenced to three years of community service and further psychiatric treatment and that is the case of michael taylor <laughs> three years of community service yeah I don't know what's going on over in West Yorkshire, but yo, are y'all okay? Yeah, like that. The most recent one was 2005. Like you guys know better. Like, you know better. You know better. But like I agree. Like I, I what don't. What was he diagnosed with? It, it wasn't ever public. Like, maybe I could be a little bit more understanding if you know. You don't have to. You know. You don't have to flaunt what you're like. I what you're struggling with, but. Right, like I, Wouldn't I. Would you want that to come? I out? believe I believe in possession, mm -hmm. and part of me, like, let's talk about Marie real quick. Yes. Like, I feel like Marie. she was one. She she had to have been like, yes, she was a godly, like, soft spoken woman. But I feel a part of me feels like she was maybe into like just more of like this satanic like worship kind of vibe. Like you're speaking in time. Like I know that's actually really common in churches. So yes, I'm not very gonna common in church. Um, you know, do any of that, but. Um, I just feel like, you know, you're constantly exercising people. You're holding these private sessions where you're doing them for eight hours throughout the entire night. And it's kind of like she's the trigger. Let me get comfy before I go in on Miss Marie. Marie, are you and like And like Marie, and the the murder of Christine believe, leads me to believe possession. But also like, oh, you think he could just do that? Like, mm -hmm. I just feel like that's like ripping limbs off of a dog like there's that's, two there's two unless it things. was a mini poodle yeah unless it was a mini poodle then that's just like a rotisserie chicken that is so <laughs> fucked up we are going to hell i didn't say that <laughs> it's me, it's me. <laughs> so okay this is what i'm thinking i do think possession could be a situation in this yeah. like i do i do you're right like n not many people are just going to right do that but um, I don't think the possession happened before Marie. I think he was either a struggling with some sort of like mental health issues. Well, and right, but even then he was just like he was just I mean, what they said was that he was just depressed, like he had financial issues. He had right. some um, back problems. And how old was he? He was 32 whenever this all happened. 
because I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if maybe like it was just something that was kind of piling up a little too fast and triggering a lot of things that have always been there, just have never mm-hmm. been surfaced. Yeah, but like for him to be afraid of the moon, like that, that sounds a lot like schizophrenia to mm-hmm. me. Like thinking like yeah. people are, or things are after you or whatever. Yeah. Um, but now. I think she just fed into it. Let I think she either A, fed into it or B, he wasn't possessed. He was honestly just depressed and like a normal person, right? And she had him convinced. And she gets to him. And because she's doing all that shit, you know, if you talk about something so much, if you do something so much, you're creating portals. And you're manifesting the, those it. Those things In are a way following you. don't even you. know, yeah. Yeah, those things are following you. Mm-hmm. And they're going to find lost souls like that to hook on to. Yeah. And he could have been one that yeah. they latched onto. And she fed into it as like a... I don't know. Maybe she had to do some sort of sacrifice, yeah, to like keep herself protected. Yeah, and I wonder where the hell Marie was that night with when when Christine died. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing because she stayed over there all the time at night to exercise yeah. well, the moon. Well, so they left the exorcism at eight in the morning. This happened at nine forty-five in the morning. Oh, at nine forty-five in the morning. So See, was, like. Yeah, but also like you have to think too. Like oh, the other reason why I do maybe like possession holds kind of like mm-hmm. a strong truth to me is that um, he had just like everyone said like he was like physically abused during this eight hours of exorcism. I mean, yeah. Like, how do you have strength after that to like mutilate two different things? Yeah, I don't know. That's why I was thinking like maybe because you know no no weapon yeah but if you, you did have something like skin if you did have something like split personality then your second personality wouldn't even know you just you look, wouldn't even know that that right. happened yeah so i mean it really could be it could be a lot of things you know normally i'm not gonna dismantle a, a possession because i believe in it fully but i'm just saying like something so weird with marie right. in terms of the murder well this case always like every single like source that i got it from like every at the bottom they're always like well, what do you think do you think that he was possessed or do you think that like yeah i think marie wanted him and i think i think him. he was so just like in love with her that he was just gonna believe anything she said yeah and, and he she just kind of had him like convinced and like fed into it i and mean like, if you're gas lit or manipulated yeah. or coerced or groomed enough to th- you will think that you are possessed absolutely yeah just another case though and they, they stood up stayed up every night talking in tongues exercising the fucking moon that's yeah. more than enough time right to groom someone into thinking while so. his wife and five children are sleeping and then yeah what happened to the fucking kids oh i i did read a little bit of it and it like how do they live without yeah. any of this so actually he lives uh they believe he lives back in um this town of austin yeah west yorkshire but they didn't say much about the kids i just don't think i think they kind of stayed with the grandparents and i mean what do you do but really your dad's only in jail for four years after after killing their mom right like what that makes no sense we need we okay so we're not gonna lie to you guys we 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 just pause and we stop and talk about this and we have our theory we have another and this is all allegedly this is a theory so if marie you're listening to this if anybody's (laughs) listening to this this is a theory a theory okay this is our theory tell them we think that um this prayer group because they were referred to this prayer group Mm -hmm. that they had just picked out like someone who was mentally unstable or Mm -hmm. mentally ill and they kind of just like had him convinced him convinced him that he was possessed and then during the exorcism like people there was reports of him just getting verbally and physically abused so i think they just like beat the shit out of him and then i we go ahead finish it off Uh, well before we move on we think like all of them were following marie yeah like because you know that we were talking about like how she was like the leader of this prayer group no that's some cult shit yeah but before what was what do you want me to say next I want you to say who what what you think happened after the exorcism. Oh, I think after the exorcism that they all went back to the house to like get him settled, and then it was a sacrifice of Christine, who they had gotten to trust them, mm-hmm. and uh, then killed her. It was a giant sacrifice in a same yeah. situation. Um, but and maybe they have ties with the local police, maybe. and that's why he got four <clears throat> years. No, but he was they like, don't honestly, say anything, and you'll just go to a psychiatric ward. No, they used the re- like the finders, the religious card. Like, yeah. oh, you can't, you can't do anything. It's religion. Mm-hmm. It's the, the devil made me do it. 
yep, situation. Yeah, that will maybe do it. But then also, we were talking, we were like, <laughs> we were joking around for a little bit because um, Morgan's got a big announcement she's got to say at the end. It's not like a good announcement. No, it's not an announcement at all. It's so It's sad. a sad fucking ordeal. <laughs> but anyways, we were like... <laughs> Like people are gonna think I'm the worst um, when talking about this shit because we were laughing our dicks off yeah. in the beginning, but because it's so it sounds fake, right? It sounds like, like just bullshit. It sounds like some fucking horse shit. Like the entire thing, like the we got the forty demons out in eight hours, but we can't take the extra because if we broke down that ratio, you had eight hours, you got forty demons. It would technically only take you another fifteen to five to fifteen minutes to get the other three out. <laughs> So what are we talking about? And then you're like, oh, I got all of the basic ones out. The basic bitches are gone with their Starbucks. But But we left murder. We left like. And then when he's like, don't let him go. He's going to kill Christine. Right. And like. And then that was like placing that in his head. Yeah. And like, that's another thing I was going to say when you were saying it. Like, why would you even say like, oh, it's murder that's left behind? Because that's what he's thinking. Like, oh, okay, I have to murder someone to get rid Mm -hmm. of this one. Yeah. I don't want to wait eight hours for this priest to recharge, even though it would take him an extra to beat 15 the shit minutes. Out of me. Yeah. Like, what? No, I just want to get this over with. I'll get yeah. him out myself. Yep. Uh, anyways, I, I can't. St- I, yep. I, I and you're that. going to jail. <laughs> Except for he literally did not. He literally did not go to jail. Yep. And you're going to the psych court. <laughs> Except for you also got it out. Except you. for you also walked free. Yeah. Alrighty. All right, Taylor, what do you got for us? Okay, it's my turn. Today I'm going to be doing something pretty different. Honestly, this is a first for me, um, which is covering fully. I've done it a little bit before, but never fully an active case. Ooh. And once I'm done, I'm going to be discussing many updates that we have in cases that we have recently covered, not recently, but over the years covered, which includes Madeline McCann, Snapchat murders, Briceless Pizza, and Holly Bobo. Oh. So for this episode, I'm going to be covering the mysterious death of Lauren Smith Fields. Um, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, then you're not on TikTok um, because this case took over TikTok and just social media in general um, at the beginning of this year. Like that's how like a few months ago it was. Um, And we're recording this on uh, uh, we're recording this episode on Tuesday, April 26th. And this will be released. This episode will be released on May 5th, which is a little over a week from today. And I'm just going, I say that to remind you that again, this is an active case and changes, reports, updates can be released at any moment, like whenever. Therefore, if you are listening to this episode in a week from release, on the day of the release, a month from the release, or two years from now, this is probably not the most updated version. Um, If there are any major updates, I will either, depending on the amount of update that we have, I will either A, release an additional episode that'll be a bonus and it'll just say Lawrence uh, Smith Fields case Um, or I will release it on our Instagram and social medias just to discuss it with you guys Um, but with all of that being said please be kind because again this is an active case and let's get into it first time ever crimey So this is the mysterious death of Lauren Smith Fields in Bridgeport, Connecticut at around 9 p.m. on December 13th, 2021. Lauren's mother and her oldest brother or older brother, um, Chantel Fields and Lakeem Jetter, went to check on Lauren at her apartment as she had not responded to any calls or texts from them in the last 24 hours. This was completely out of character for the 23-year-old. Lauren was attending Norwalk Community College with dreams of becoming a physical therapist at one point or possibly a makeup artist. Yes, um, girl. But sounds like me changing my yeah. career every five minutes. Um, but there's different reports on that. She loved fashion, traveling, makeup, being with friends and family, always chatting with close ones, rarely leaving a room without her phone in hand. So they knew something was wrong when she wasn't getting back to them. And she also ran a small business out of her home. And I I couldn't figure out exactly what it is, but I think it has something to do with like cosmetology and fashion. Okay, cool. So um, when Chantel and Lakeem arrived at Lauren's front door, they found a note that read, Quote, if you're looking for Lauren, call this number. And there was a number written out below. Immediately, they called the number and um, they learned that it belonged to Lauren's landlord who lived just upstairs. So the landlord quickly came down the stairs to speak with Lauren's mother and brother. 
where he told them that Lauren was dead and had been since 6.59 a.m. the morning before, like well over 24 hours later. What? Mm Mm-hmm. And Chantel falls to her knees screaming in pain, like the type of pain that I pray no mother would ever have to feel like that shriek. I can't even talk about it, like that shriek. And she's screaming as Lauren's landlord is trying to give uh, her brother the number of the lead detective on Lauren's case. So they know she's dead. And now they're like a detective. Uh, What what the fuck happened? What the fuck happened? This is almost 48 hours later. Yeah. So the lead detective on Lauren's case was Bridgeport Police Department Detective Kevin Cronin. And Lakeem grabs his phone immediately, calls the detective, and is trying to figure out what the fuck happened. Cronin explains that his department was unable to track down their information, which is why the family was never contacted. So side note. Okay. 2021. We, they literally had her phone, her wallet, cash, keys in her possession which included her student id card her home address her permanent address which is her mother's house and they couldn't contact the family right you couldn't contact the school who would then contact the family you couldn't fucking jump on her phone that is being blown up by her family and answer it and say hi this is the police department yeah Yeah. like what what do you mean yeah what (sighs) he went on to explain that lauren had quote been on a date with an older white man from Bumble on the night of the 11th. But don't worry, because he's a nice guy. Oh. End quote. Thank you, detective. Thank you. I'm so glad you approved of her date. Yeah, why? What? what? The family I'm waited. already pissed. I'm already pissed off. <laughs> it just gets worse from here. So Detective Cronin gave very little additional information. He's like, look, I'm, I'm on my way there right now. I'll be I'll meet you at Lauren's apartment in 30 mi- minutes. Y'all just wait there. So they're like, OK, so the family waits and 30 minutes goes by. No sign of the detective. Another 30 minutes goes by. Still no sign of him. So at this point, it's probably 1030 at night. And they can't get into this apartment. They're standing outside, freaking the fuck out. They just learned that their daughter and sister is dead. And so they start calling the the detective over and over again. No response. No answer. Well, then he finally does answer an hour and a half later. And he says, stop calling me. And then hung up on them. What? Detective Cronin never called the family back and never came to the apartment. Stop calling me. It's your fucking job, dude. Then he never came to the apartment. I mean, it, this is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. So they literally, like at midnight, finally left after calling the police department. They're like, there's nothing we can do tonight. He's not in the office. And he's Wait, a lead detective. You might have on a already case. said this, and I might have totally blanked. Was is family local to where she was living? They lived like twenty minutes away. Okay. Like it was in the okay. area. Like Same area. they didn't drive like miles. So away. they literally couldn't have drove to their house. Like it was <laughs> like just wait there. Oh my god. Yeah. So um Chantel and Lakeem went home calling family members, friends, their community, like asking for help because this just made no sense to them. Is this even legal um to not be contacted about the death of your 23-year-old daughter oh, well over 24 hours after her death and having to find out from a note hung on the fucking door and a landlord telling you? What the fuck? At Lauren's apartment, there was no crime scene tape, no evidence markers, nothing. If you walked in, you would have no idea what had happened. And you would never know that this was a crime scene that was being investigated with a lead detective. At this point, the family knew very little as to what had happened to Lauren that night. Police kept everything very tight-lipped. So I'm not sure what order or at which point Lauren's family received the full story. But before we move on to the investigation, I don't even want to fucking call it that. But whatever the police did, just walking around with their dicks in their their hands. um, I want to (laughs) half ass attempt. Literally, I just want to walk you through the timeline of Lauren's last hours from the account of the man that was with her. The very nice guy from Bumble. Mm. And also before we move on. The detective approved guy from Bumble. Yes. Before we also move on, I do want to um, say I'm going to be calling him Bumble Man or Bumble Date. We do know his name. 
Um, but I've <laughs> seen somewhere where he's been suing people. Okay. And um, it's man. very simple to look up. And it starts with an M, the first name, and the last name starts with an L. So just g- look it up. But um, oh. I'm not getting sued. You know what? I might take a bullet and get sued for Lauren's sake because this shit is so fucked. So I'm not sure that we've talked about this yet, but sorry, Marley's wedding is coming up and it seems to be Mm -hmm. happening so fast. And I don't know about you, but the second a big event is approaching and the outfit, coordination, decor, stress sets in, my skin immediately breaks out. We've all had struggles with our skin, and that's why we're excited to partner with Apostrophe, a sponsor of Creeps and Crimes. Working with Apostrophe has been so nice and easy. If I have a question, I simply get on my portal, message my provider, and they reply so quickly with detailed explanations every time. Not to mention, you're talking to a real dermatologist that knows your skin, created your treatment plan, and tailored it just for you. You don't have to go through the hassle of scheduling an appointment and our skin is glowing. glowing. Y'all, it's glowing. Apostrophe treats all types of acne, from hormonal acne to facial acne and even chest knee, back knee, and butt knee. They treat breakouts from head to toe. Apostrophe is a prescription skincare company that offers science-backed oral and topical medications that are clinically proven to help clear acne. Apostrophe connects you with a board-certified dermatologist who will create a personalized treatment plan that is perfectly tailored to your unique skin. Simply fill out Apostrophe's online quiz about your skin goals and medical history, then snap a few selfies and your dermatologist will create your customized treatment plan. And we have a special deal for our audience. Save $15 off of your first visit with an apostrophe provider at apostrophe.com slash creeps and crimes when you use our code creeps and crimes. This code is only available for our listeners. To get started, just go to apostrophe.com slash creeps and crimes and click begin visit. Then use our code creeps and crimes at sign up and you'll get your first visit for only $5. That is A-P-O-S-T-R-O-P-H-E dot com slash creeps and crimes and use that code creeps and crimes to get your dermatologist crafted treatment plan for $5. And we thank Apostrophe for sponsoring the podcast. So this is from the account of Bumble Guy. So three days before Lauren's death, she matched with this man on the dating app called Bumble. The two messaged for about three days before Lauren invited him over to hang out on the evening of Saturday, December 11th. The 37-year-old man arrived at the 23-year-old Lauren's apartment at around 9.30 p.m. with a bottle of tequila. The two drank, ate, played games, and then began watching a movie. A few minutes after the movie started, reportedly, Lauren was laying on the couch while the man was lounging near her or beside her, and according to the Bumble Man, she told him that she was feeling sick, so she got up and went to the bathroom, and he heard her throw up. A few minutes later, she returned, and she seemed fine, so he figured maybe she had just drank too much or, like, ate too much food and needed to get it out of her system. So at some point after this, Lauren's brother texted her to say that he was outside. And according to some reports, she either ran like laundry that she had done for him and her mother outside to give it to her brother or others said that he was dropping off something to her. And so she returned inside after this. Well, according to the Bumble Man, um, she then went straight to the restroom. Like after she came in, she's like, "Okay, one second. And so she went straight back to the bathroom and she stayed there for like another 10 to 15 minutes before returning to the couch. And a few minutes later, she fell asleep while watching the movie. So once the movie ended, Bumble Man gently picked up Lauren, who was still sleeping, carried her to her bed, tucked her in, got into the bed with her and fell asleep. He told officers that the two did not have sex and that he had slept in his clothes that he had wore over that day, only taking his shoes off. Bumble Man said that he then woke up at 3 a.m. to use the restroom and he could hear Lauren snoring. He returned back to the bed and fell asleep, once again beside her. At 6.30 a.m. in the early morning hours of now Sunday, December 12th, Bumble Man woke up and noticed that Lauren wasn't snoring. And I guess they were facing each other at this point. And then he realizes she's not breathing. So she was rolled over onto her right side and she had dried blood in, on, and around her right nostril. He immediately got up and called police. And that 911 call has not been released to the public yet. 
Officers and first responders arrived at the scene just moments later, and when they knocked on the door, Bumble Man was there to open it, and they uh, he ushered them to Lauren's body. Officer Carla Rommel, I think that's how you pronounce it, uh, um, recorded in the case file that Bumble Man was, quote, frantic and trembling, visibly shaken. Officer Rommel also reported that when she entered the room, she found lauren lying on her back in the floor of her bedroom with dried blood on in and around her right nostril she was then pronounced dead upon arrival at 6 59 a.m with the medic saying that it was clear that she had been dead for at least an hour at this point so okay. bubble bumble i don't want to say bubble Bumble Man was only briefly questioned at the scene for a timeline of events, which is what I just read to you. He was never detained. He was never brought in for further questioning, nor was he ever or has ever been considered a person of interest in Lauren's case, which is why he can sue if we were to say his name. Interesting. Mm hmm. Police did not even investigate the crime scene until a week later. However, I don't know if I would even call it an investigation that they did. They honestly just fucking walked in and looked around and left. On December 29th, Lauren's family was instructed to move Lauren's belongings out of her apartment. During this process, they discovered empty bottles of alcohol, cups filled with liquor, plates of food that had been flipped over onto the ground and not ever picked up, blood stains on Lauren's sheets, a random pill in the middle of the floor, which after further examination, what the, after further examination, it came out that that was a prescription sedative that Lauren had never been known to use and was never subs- prescribed. It. Nice. In addition to all of this, they found a bottle of lubricant near the bed in a used condom in the trash can. Lauren's family had to fight for police to even examine these findings as evidence until the, they finally agreed to collect it from the family. So the family had gone in there prepared that this was like a crime scene. So they like were protective of themselves at the instruction of their lawyer. Mm-hmm. And they had brought like bags to put things in to try to keep it from being contaminated. So finally, they get police to come and collect all of this. And days later, Lauren's family lawyer, Darnell Crossland, reached out to the forensic lab to follow up with the evidence examinations when he learned that nothing was ever submitted by police to the forensics lab for Lauren's case. What are they doing? Despite all of this, officers had the audacity to request DNA samples from All of Lauren's family members, quote, just in case they had contaminated any evidence that they had to force police to take and was never put into the crime Mm, lab. That sounds like planting evidence. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, they never requested as much as a fingerprint from Bumble Man, who was literally the last person to see Lauren alive. For weeks, police had no contact with Lauren's family. No matter how hard the family fought, they were getting no information, no details, nothing. They were completely left in the dark. And so social media took a hold of this case and did what the mainstream media did not. Armchair detectives, TikTokers, Reddit sleuths, Twitter users, Instagram graphics all fought for Lauren's justice, pushing her case to everyone's For You Explore and Twitter news pages. Hashtag Lauren Smithfield was growing at a rapid rate, and the family used this to their advantage. They began speaking out. Their lawyer was issuing statements, talking to whoever would listen, and it was working. It was sad because when Gabby Petito went missing, it was all that we could talk about. Her face was everywhere on every single news channel, front page articles. It was it was all that we could say or breathe or see on our for you pages, see on our news channels like it was all that we had. And it's because Gabby fit the mold, the blonde hair, the blue eyes, the pale skin, the simple, safe life, van, van life for YouTuber, even though she only had one video. But what? 
But when beautiful 23-year-old black woman named Lauren Smith Fields goes, is found, not even goes missing, is found dead in her apartment, and the only person in there is this white man who's almost a decade, no, more than a decade older than her, who she had met literally the night of, he's in there with her. We don't blink an eye. The last yeah. person to ever see her alive and you don't detain him and you, you don't interview him and you don't search the apartment. You don't contact the radio victim's silence family. on everything but social media. And the media doesn't care like the mainstream media doesn't care. It just didn't fit their agen- agendas. But if Lauren was a white woman and the Bumble Man was a black man, mm-hmm. I can guarantee you Lauren's face would have been on every cover of a magazine that Gabby Petito's yep. was. It would have been filling the grocery store checkout lines just like Gabby's was. But it wasn't that way. And her family had to fight. They had to fight for Lauren's name to make it on the For You pages, to be interviewed by big mainstream media interviewers or whoever the fuck they are, to have police and even their mayor take them fucking serious. It's so fucked up. I'm pissed. It's so, it's so fucked up. It's just, it's just fucked up. It's fucked up. It's just, I feel gross. Like mm-hmm. I, I had to press pause for a second because I just feel gross talking yeah. about, it. I feel disgusting. I like, I just want to like itch my skin off. I feel so nasty talking about this. This is horrific. On January 21st, 2022, Laura, L- lawyer Darnell Crossland issued a notice announcing that Lauren Smith Field's family would then be suing the Bridgeport Police Department as they had failed to properly investigate Lauren's case, take her death seriously, and have continually been racially insensitive. Croslin further alleged that Bumble Man and Detective Kevin Cronin have some sort of connection, according to the tips and reports that had been sent in to his office, no requesting shit. that this detective's phone records be examined from the day of the um, inv- the the crime scene was investigated and have this all done by internal affairs. In a New York New York Times article, Bumble Man's lawyer reported that his client had been um, compliant with police and continually has been since Lauren's death. However, the lawyer, nor would the police, confirm or deny whether or not additional questioning or interviews had taken place since. So basically, they didn't. Yeah. On January 23rd, 2022, it was Lauren's 24th birthday. She's our fucking age, dude. Oh, my God. Family, friends, supporters, the community, and volunteers rallied, marching from the Bridgeport Police Department's office to the city government center where the mayor's office is located to demand answers from officials, demanding justice for Lauren. The next day, January 24th, Connecticut Office of the Chief Medical Examiner released Lauren Smithfield's autopsy results publicly. According to NPR, they concluded that Lauren had died of, quote, acute intoxication due to combined effects of alcohol, promethazine, hydrazine, and I think that's how you said it, hydrazine, and fentanyl. Hydrox. Hydroxy. Hydroxine. Yeah, hydroxine and fentanyl. Yeah. Jesus. And it was all found in her system, leaving, ruling her manner of death to be accidental. Lauren's family and friends were enraged. Lauren did not even fucking smoke weed. She was a vegan, like plant-based diet. She was a health fanatic. She was very careful about what she put into her body. She would never, ever willingly take these drugs. Not to mention that these, some of these are considered to be date rape drugs. And this man who was in the apartment with Lauren in the hours just before she died claimed that they never had sex, but there was a used condom filled with semen near the bed. But yet the man's DNA has never been collected or even compared to the semen that was found in the trash bin. They didn't take the condom. The family did. The family had to pick that fucking condom up. Could you imagine? You know what I, I'm still stuck on from the very, very beginning is that they were drinking all night. They were drinking mm-hmm. tequila what fucking man drinks all night and then gets up at 3 a.m. and 6 a.m.? You're fucking zong. You're fuck. You're, you're lying. You're lying. So and then in addition to this, they never tested the alcohol that he had brought over to see if it was laced. And to me, it seems like the throwing up my brother's here, the falling asleep during the movie was Lauren like hinting at this dude to leave. Right. Because that's what I would do. Yeah. And or she had been drugged by him. 
Yeah. Like she had maybe denied him and then been drugged. Also, who the fuck meets someone for the first time after three days of messaging, carries that person to bed, tucks them in, doesn't have sex with them, yet gets still gets in the bed with them, and you barely just met them? Right. Fuck no. You either and sleep you on the couch. you wake up at two perfect times to solidify an alibi. Mm-hmm. Or what? I, not an alibi at all, but... A timeline. A timeline. A timeline. She, well, she was away, or she was alive I at snoring. 3.30... Like, oh. no. And and also, like, you sleep on the couch. You don't fucking, you don't fucking get in the bed with someone that you met, right. you messaged three days ago and talk, like, you can take them to their bed, yeah, but you sleep on the couch or you fucking leave. You call an Uber. It's 2021, dude. Call your fucking Uber. Get the fuck out of there. You're 37. Stop being a fucking creep. Yeah. Like, what? And it's just red flag after red flag for me. The next day, on January 25th, Bridgeport police released that due to the current results, um, the the release that were released by the MEO office from the autopsy, they would now be investigating Lauren Smithfield's death as a crime with the DEA assisting them in the investigations with their narcotics division. So they're not even looking at this as like a homicide. They're looking at this like, oh, who gave her fentanyl? Yeah. Are you kidding? Fucking joke. On January 31st, Bridgeport Mayor Dro- Joe Gainham announced that the internal affairs would be investigating the Bridgeport Police Department and ordered Detective Kevin Cronin and another officer to be suspended for mishandling the investigation. And a week before that, one of the other officers who was on the case just happened to take an early retirement out of nowhere. Okay. And what about the chief of police? Where's he at, right? Oh, yeah. He's in federal prison. Um, He has been in federal prison for a year at this point for fraud. And you're in fucking jail. (laughs) And you're going to jail. Um, There have been very little to no updates in Lauren's case since all of this. I know that her family has been working really hard alongside Brenda Lee Rawls' family, who is another black woman who died on the same day as Lauren in the same neighborhood, and her family was not notified either. What they're the working fuck? together to pass House Bill 5349, and this bill would make it a requirement for officers to take training on how to speak with victims' families, notify them within 24 hours, and create a disciplinary action for those who do not notify within 24 hours. Um, but I do, I do want to say, like, for the most part, like, people are voting for this, right? Like, the mm-hmm. people in the community, whatever, whoever it is, they're voting for this, um, except for 10 of them. Because they're like, that's not fair. Because then that means we're going to have to call the families and not be able to tell them in person, which is that what we're supposed to do. It's going to put too much pressure on us. It gives so-and-so too much too much power. Oh, so but, what, you want to wait a week so it went until it's convenient for you to get to their house then? And, and then you, how are you going to investigate I would much rather have a phone call ASAP than some random ass dude I've never seen or female I've never seen before knocking on my door to tell me that. No, not even fucking that. You want you want to find a note with a phone number that says, hey, if you're looking for Lauren, call me. Yeah. It's huh? so fucked up. It's Ugh. so fucked up. It's so fucked up. I, I literally, I don't think I'm going to be able to get over it. No. I'm pissed. I'm pissed. When was that last update? The most recent is all from like January and then February, um, early February. They're going to fucking the, let it go cold. Yeah, they're, the police of course department they're, they're going to. They're letting it chill out. But not with us, bitches. No, no, no way. And look, that's another thing. They're, it's not even they're going to let it go cold. It's it's like us. Like really, social media is what got that case to even be anything. Right. Took it. And it's already slipping, slipping by. Like you can tell it's it's falling off. It's falling off. And I just can't, I can't have it. I literally can't have it. After it, like reading this and looking into it, by the way, there, it's almost like the Holly Bobo case. It's so hard to look up. Like there's just nothing, nothing is on in it. one place. Everything's everywhere. It's insane. Like there's not even, there's typically at this point in a case like this, one that has this much following following there would be like a timeline article about it Mm -hmm. or a wikipedia page or a murderpedia page or something and there's nothing there's nothing that was me relying on youtube videos their sources then going to their sources and then going to additional articles and then going through backtracking this whole like ass backwards way of figuring this case out and it shouldn't be like that it shouldn't be like that it's just ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. Oh, my God. So that's a case of Lauren uh, <sighs> Smith-Fields. 
Well, let's, I hope I hope in some way somehow that this aids the family along in getting me too. answers. And, and I hope for I, Laura getting justice. I hope this all of everything that I gave you guys today was up to date and correct. Um, like I said, it was very challenging to look up. Like it, it's just weird. Like so weird. Mm-hmm. So weird. Ugh, I'm just so fucking pissed. Yeah, I'm pissed about it too. Uh, anyways, you ready to move on to the updates? Yeah. All right. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Let's move it on. All right, guys. So the update in the Madeline Maddie McCann case is what we're going to be covering first. You probably have already seen it. We've talked about it a little bit in our Facebook groups. Um, But uh, Christian B, who was someone we did speak about and has always been kind of tied to Madeline's case when we covered it originally back. I mean, God, when was that? A year ago. A year ago. Um, he, his name's Christian B. He's a a German man. He has been convicted of a trigger warning, raping a 72 year old woman from 2005 in the same town where Madeline had gone missing. And now they have named him as a official suspect in the case, but he has not been charged yet. So we're sitting at about 15 years in May. Yep. So next, when this comes out, yeah, it'll literally be. Um, 15 years and basically the statute of limitations for serious crimes in Portugal is 15 years so they have to act very quickly so they are working with German officials to where he is in prison now to get him flown to Portugal for official interviewing but there is an alleged like claimed confession that is maybe recorded Maybe. Um, and it's from the 10 year anniversary at a bar. He was talking to someone at a bar, maybe his friend. And maybe we even did talk about this. So maybe you were right. Yeah, I like kind of remember. And it. we Cause I remember being pissed that we're like, Wait, what do you mean? They didn't do anything about it. Yeah, he had confessed and said that he had done it. And then after that, I, if I'm not wrong, they went and actually searched his property in Germany and where he had been staying in Portugal. So um, they're trying to get him over for questioning, but he has now been officially named a suspect, which is a huge deal for a 15 year old case. Yeah, um, for he's sure. Now in his 40s and, and one of the most famous, one of the most famous abductions. And um, now they have phone records that confirm that he was within the vicinity, which they might have had. I just can't even really remember all the detail. I'm going to have to go back and listen to the case. But they can't. They did confirm that they do have phone records that placed him on the same day in the same vicinity um, where Madeline was taken. Damn. So that's and that you're going thing. to jail. And you're going to jail, even though you're already in it. So for Bryceless Pizza, there had been a recent update from Montana of a sighting from a detective named Ethan Smith, who said that on April, like early April, he, I guess, was driving down the road or walking and there was a guy who looked just like Bryce, like red hair, tattoos, like smile, all the things that drove by him on a bike. And um, they reported this to the family, which is very active and still searching for Bryce. And um, they were pretty convinced that it was him, but they were able to confirm yesterday, um, we just found this update, that they were able to make contact with a young man who they believe to be Bryce's twin brother, who could be because they literally look just like apparently. And they were able to verify his identity and confirm that he was not Bryce. The photo being circulated of the young man on the bike is um, Bryce's lookalike. But it sadly is not Bryce. And the family was absolutely astounded by the resemblance between the two. So. Wow. Really sad. I hope. I was so excited when I saw that. Yeah. I was so excited. everywhere. So hopefully that one's going to be done quickly. And then last, not lastly, um, Delphi or Delphi, you guys know I never can do it. Um, There has been an update in the case, which is kind of just like a regular, regular update. They, I think they brought a, Uh, official suspect in which is someone that we've been kind of knowing of for a little bit and once they officially break that um instead of just the rumors that we are seeing now i'm going to do a full-blown re-episode on that one because that case is just insane and then lastly i want to talk a little bit about holly bobo before i get off my true crime spiel um i I hope you guys enjoyed it. I was very nervous about that episode. And luckily, you guys were very kind to me and reached out to me about a lot of things and sent me some articles. So I did want to just make some corrections. A, B, I watched a 
a few more a million more documentaries after the fact and I just wanted to make some comments so number one um I I again wanted to address Holly's family and I wanted to talk about how we were you know discussing like Karen the mother and the brother Clint and the phone call between them and basically what Karen was saying she was like you can call it what you want but it was my mother's intuition that like told me like something is absolutely not right and she was like I'm not someone that even overreacts like I just knew something wasn't right I could feel Mm -hmm. it in my bones and so that kind of answers a question for us about you know why I mean not fully but you know right in a different mother's intuition is unlike anything in this world so right and then I wanted to touch on Sheila Wasaki's um side of this and she doesn't speak about this case and I then found out from a news uh interview that before the TBI left they raided her home and took all of her devices and sifted through them before the tbi left how do they have the authority to do that they don't they literally don't so i don't know exactly no one really knows exactly what 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 went on there yeah but that just kind of is weird to me now and puts me in a different feeling towards why i still think terry Britt was involved but what are they trying to cover up with the zach adams ordeal right you know, something's just not off about that. And then other, like, same with me. I said this whenever I was reporting on it, that th- some places report that the uh, phone records line up perfectly. And then others say, like, they absolutely do not. So I think that one's just up in the air. How are sources, like, still wishy-washy? Like, I don't understand that. I, I don't get it either. I guess because like, interviews differ. Anything reporting on... Um something that's like factual or uh, for example a murder Mm -hmm. i feel like needs to go through some type of like fact check i don't know (laughs) then we'd have to go through a fact check fact check but we do fact check ourselves we do so i'm just like i don't know i don't get it i just something so off about that case i think someone was onto something um, and we, I do want you guys to know that we're still working with Lauren Taylor Agee's family very closely um, on her case and hoping to get some justice for her. They're great people. They're yeah. really great people. And we love them to pieces. So we hope that one day we can get Lauren Taylor Agee the justice that she deserves. And we're also working with some other families right now on their fa- uh, loved ones' cases that you'll be hearing a lot about soon. Um, but that's all I have for my updates. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to not be able to sleep today. This was sad. Yeah, this is a sad situation. Mm-hmm. You ready to make everybody else more sad? Oh, yeah, guys. On my way here, actually walking in the door, I got a text from my mom that my childhood doggy died. Gretchen. Gretchen. Her name was Gretchen. We rescued her when she was like maybe like six or seven. She's 14 now, probably. She was a Pomeranian, but she. Little rotisserie chicken. Little. Stop it. <laughs> I was like, I'm like, really? Like, it's not a good episode. To no, like it's be not like, a good this episode. This one's for Gretchen. And then we're like, this dude ripped this poodle to limb. Like, like what? It, I can't even say that. Anyway, it's really sad. I'm, I love Gretchen and we all love Gretchy. So, yeah. We love you, Gretchy. Fly high, baby girl. Fly high, girl. We love you. That's all. So sad. I want to post a picture of Gretchen in this YouTube video. Fly high. <laughs> I'll put like angel wings on her. Aww. And then I'll maybe I'll in have the like. Arms of the angel. <laughs> I was thinking like an old hymn. Fly away. <laughs> I was thinking like. Oh, God. What is that old hymn? You probably didn't do old hymns no, in church I'm, when you were younger. I'm referring to the Arms of the Angel commercial. Yeah, I know I what you Every about. time I saw it when I was a kid, I was like, I love dog. I love animals. <laughs> Lola, if she saw that when she was little, she'd be like, ah, ah, ah. I would be like, what's wrong? You I'd be like, like everyone dance. quiet, Arms of the Angels. <laughs> Turn it on. I love that shit. We'll, all, we'll so just, sad. we'll have like a thing for Gretchen right here. Yeah. 
she comes in like crying and i'm like how was your weekend what's going on i literally walked in, i literally like right before i opened her door i read the text i was like why is my family blowing me up i read the text and i was like oh shit and i immediately just like started tearing up and i walk in the door and her and logan are like hey it was the best road trip it was the week it looked like a lot of fun i'm like yeah <laughs> Like, it dude. was really fun. I'm like, I'm gonna kill Richard's dad. your mom. I'm gonna murder Beth Ann. Uh, anyway, on that note, <laughs> on that note, love, uh, you, Gretch. love you guys. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode. It was sad as fuck. Um, yeah. love you. Bye.